that he's the chaos muppet and I'm the order muppet. Oh, you're definitely the order muppet. Yeah. <laughs> well, hi, order muppet. <laughs> <laughs> Bloop boop boop. Bloop doop doop. Bloop doop doop. Hi, order muppet Michael here. I'm here with Molly. Are you a chaos muppet or an order I muppet? I actually, you know, so believe it or not, I think of myself as an order muppet. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, we are going to very orderly talk through some of our favorite albums from 1991. It's sort of a weird mix because we're going to talk about Amy Grant's album Heart in Motion, R.A.M.'s album Out of Time, Nirvana's Nevermind, and Pearl Jam's 10. The interesting thing that I want to talk about that sort of ties all this together is what is pop and what is rock? What are your thoughts on pop versus rock? I think there's a lot of ways to think about it. I think traditionally, if we look at it in a strictly old fashioned way, like a rock and roll song had a rock and roll beat, a specific rhythm in the drum kit that made it rock and roll, right? Mm -hmm. That has obviously dissolved uh, quite a bit over the years. A lot of pop music, I think most pop music uses a rock and roll beat. That beat is, at least according to Wikipedia, snare on two and four. Which is almost that's, everything. That's almost everything. <laughs> yeah. What I think makes pop pop is marketing. That ties in really closely with sort of what my thoughts are. I asked friends, I did some searching online, and the things that I came to sort of break down into four categories. Lyrical content, the performance and the instruments used, the musical structure, and the audience. There's another thing that it doesn't really fit into those that I think is actually a really interesting thing to consider, but it's something that we've talked about before. Pop is singles based, rock is albums based. <gasps> yes! Yes. But that doesn't really fit into these. So lyrical content. A lot of my friends were saying things like pop lyrics don't make sense and are silly and are meaningless. You can sing along. You can sing along. And meaningless to whom? Yeah. The target audience is very meaningful to them. There is a certain group of people who are rock supremacists. Over the years that has started to shift a little bit. I think there's more and more so-called poptimism <laughs> out there. But I think there have been people who think that rock is cool and pop is not cool. It's for, you know, teenage girls, preteen girls. And I think that that premise is sexist. And I think that it is shallow. One friend said that pop song lyrics are about love and rock song lyrics are about the self. Love is about the self. Yes, yes. We're getting philosophical here. <laughs> of the things that I looked up online, the Wikipedia articles for rock music and pop music I thought were really interesting. Mm. On the rock article, Wikipedia says, like pop music, Rock lyrics often stress romantic love, but also address a wide variety of other themes that are frequently social or political. So I do think that, at least traditionally, rock music is more likely to be political than pop music. Now? No, all bets are off now. I mean, I even think since... I don't know, the civil rights movement when James Brown was writing Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud and yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but would we say that that's R&B or soul or? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I think that pop can be any subgenre yes. because pop to me is about marketing. It's about putting out music that will be bought by the largest audience possible. It's like top 40 radio. So this is interesting. Wikipedia also said that rock music is a youth revolt against consumerism and conformity. Mm. Now see, that is a definition that I can buy. Yeah, they contrasted that with pop. It is more status quo consumerism and conformity. Definitely. Yeah, and I I, I... I definitely see that. Yes. Especially with the whole marketing twinge. Yes. Yeah. Interestingly though, the term pop song actually goes back to like the 20s and it really meant any popular song. But when we started to say pop music was around the same time that we started to say rock music mm. in the late 50s. So and they were created as terms to contrast against each nope. other. They were no. the same thing. <gasps> pop rock in the record store. Yes. Yeah. Pop and rock, at least in the view of the late 50s, pop and rock were the same thing. When it got into the late 60s, they started to diverge. But I think it's mostly marketing. Mm -hmm. oh, I do think that like what you said about rock being a rebellion against consumerism is really interesting because I think of certain rock bands who have been on TRL or whatever, right? Who, where they're taking this teen rebellion 
and packaging it perfectly in saran wrap for sale. Right. Right? I think that is a very interesting idea to explore. Which is why selling out is a much bigger phenomenon in rock yes. than it is in pop. Okay, so that's lyrical content. The, the next was performance and instruments used. According to Friends, rock musicians play instruments and pop musicians do not. Not true. Rock music has more organic sounds. Maybe more, but What's not... What's organic about an electric guitar? It's still created by strings vibrating, whereas you can sit at a computer and never touch an instrument. Oh, no. you, and... set, you put enough effects pedals on and yeah, yeah. <laughs> it goes out the window, yeah. I think. One thing that I think is interesting, the rock music tends to be a band of three to five people, most often four. Pop music is most often a singer a or, yeah. or four or five singers, or yeah. if you're Korean, seven or eight singers. According to Wikipedia, Rock music has an emphasis on musicianship and live performance, and whereas pop is more about the, the finished product and the presentation, yeah. So I think those are all interesting, and mm -hmm. there's something to some of those, not necessarily all of them. A musical structure. One of my friends said extended guitar solos, and yes, you do tend to not have extended guitar solos in pop music, other than Prince playing on a Madonna track, maybe, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, is Prince a rock artist or a pop artist? Yes. <laughs> One of my friends said that rock musicians write their own music and pop musicians do not, and that is not the case. At least not anymore. I found a discussion on Reddit where someone said that pop music is in major keys and rock music is in minor keys. And that is just so dumb. It's, it's when music theory fails us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so according to Wikipedia, rock music has simple rhythms in 4-4 four, four with a snare emphasis on 2 and 4. But okay. now, so does pop. Unless we're talking prog rock, in which case, you know, you've got fives and <laughs> Anything sevens. Anything goes, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wikipedia also says that pop music focuses on repeated choruses and hooks that are easily danceable. But I think a lot of rock is easily danceable and a, a lot of rock has repeated choruses and hooks. We'll get into that more later today. The last category is the one that I think Molly and I both adhere to the most, which is who the audience is or the intended audience. Pop music is packaged and marketed and designed to be consumable by the largest audience possible. This is the classic Top 40 radio. It's the Billboard Hot 100. It's record companies trying to make as much money as they can off of the artists that they represent. And to this end, I think that any genre of music can be pop. Rock is pop. Country music is pop. R&B is pop. It's not the style, it's how it is marketed, how it is sold, how it is performed. You know, when you're on TRL with Carson Daly, was that what his name was? Tim Carson, I almost said Carson Cressley, which is queer eye <laughs> for the straight guy. You're on with Carson Daly, you are a pop musician. I don't care if you're Good Charlotte. I don't care if you are Avril Lavigne. You're a pop musician if you're on TRL in, you know, circa 2001. Right. If you're on a Billboard Hot 100, even if you never intended as a musician to get there, congratulations, <laughs> you're a pop musician now. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I thought was really interesting in the Wikipedia article, rock music appropriates black musical traditions and packages them for young, male, middle-class white audiences. So does pop music. So does pop music. And that is another tangent that I could go off on for days, but all, all, all American popular music, and I'm using the broader term of pop, there is African American music. All of it. Yeah. Don't argue with me, you will lose. <laughs> yeah, a first date did try to argue that with me. <laughs> And he was like, what about- oh, the poor thing. He was like, what about bluegrass? I'm like, honey, let me teach you about some instruments. The banjo is an African instrument. <laughs> Ways to not have a second date with Michael. <laughs> There's pop versus rock. I think we can leave that behind now. Let's move on to the first album that we're gonna talk about. Amy Grant, Heart in Motion. Rock, just kidding. <laughs> when I looked at just this album as a whole for the first time, because again, we were talking about pop is more about singles. When I looked at this album, I was surprised that there were so many songs from this album that were on the radio. Four of the songs on this album peaked at lower than 10 on the Billboard charts. There was another one that got to 20, and there was another single that didn't chart. This whole album is incredibly sing-alongable, and it's pretty formulaic, but I don't think that's a bad thing. There are a lot of key changes in this album, and things like cheesy flat six to flat seven to one chords, like that like backdoor cadence. But the thing about a key change is that it's thrilling for mm -hmm. the audience, mm -hmm. right? When you hear that happen, even if you don't understand the music theory behind it, or even 
know what is happening is a key change. It feels exciting. Yeah. That's why Whitney Houston does it. That's why Bon Jovi does it. That's right. why Amy Grant does it. Right. That's why Beyonce does it. All pop. <laughs> One thing that's interesting about the key changes is that they seem to always move to a key that allows Amy to sing a good pseudo belty high note mm -hmm. on B or C. That mm. seemed, those, those seem to be her money notes. It's written to highlight her voice. Yeah. So Baby Baby, when you listen to Baby Baby, it sounds like there are so many key changes in it. There really aren't. They trick you. There's a key change up while she sings. And then an instrumental after, key changes back down to the original key. That is tricky. It's so smart though. It just, but it doesn't feel like it. The key change back down, they do it instrumentally in such a way that it doesn't feel like you're modulating down. It just feels like you're modulating and it kind of feels off kilter. So that when she can just know getting over a U again, she can go up again. And it's like, oh my God, it's even oh, higher man. now. It's not. <laughs> Have you researched who the like writers, producers were? There weren't any names that I recognized. Mm. So I'm guessing they're probably more in the Christian uh, mm. music realm. You know what? Okay, that's a really interesting thing to think about though. Because Amy Grant came from a Christian contemporary music world. This was her first sort of breakout crossover album that was on the pop charts. And the thing about Christian contemporary music is it is written specifically to get an emotional response. And those kinds of key changes, I mean, I can hear, like, I'm, I'm thinking back to Shout being to the Lord. in <laughs> totally, like, praise and worship band kind of stuff. You're having an ecstatic moment and that music is facilitating that yeah. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so this album, it starts especially strong with Good For Me, Baby Baby, Every Heartbeat, and That's What Love Is For, which are the four songs of hers that charted less than 10. And they're all really good pop songs. But then we get sort of a big swerve to Ask Me, which is sort of a harrowing song about survivals of child sexual abuse. And it was also a single it didn't chart, but it also was a single and it's like, why this one? That's so weird. Because there is a demographic that is all over that song. Yeah. Also, it's one of the more explicitly Christian songs on the album. Yes. Galileo could be a really cute song and I would love it a lot more if it didn't have the verse about Columbus because fuck that guy. If you're listening through this album as an album, when you get to Galileo, at least in my estimation, by that point, the key changes actually start to be a little tiring because they're like using the same tricks. But then the end of the album is considerably weaker. You're not alone. Hats, How Can We See That Far and Hope Set High, I think are bad songs. But I really like You're Not Alone. <laughs> I like I like the sort of power ballad aspect of it with that grinding guitar. Mm. You know, there's something Journey of it, mm -hmm. right? Journey the band. And I'm like, you know, I want to sing it in a karaoke bar like and take it way too seriously. <laughs> like, ah, you're not alone. Yeah. yeah, but I think the one standout in the last half of the album is I Will Remember You. I think that song is like cheesy in the most delicious way and it's sweet and it's got that late 80s like dude action movie, the romantic ending. Like he finally gets the girl and he's all bloody and they're riding off into the sunset. Yeah. Like it sounds like that, but in a really fun way, I think. We already talked a little bit about Amy's Christian faith and it's funny how even when it's not an explicitly Christian song, these songs are all so bubblegum, squeaky clean mm -hmm. that like you could change one word and it's a Christian song. For instance, Baby Baby mm -hmm. is about her six week old baby. <gasps> Is it really? Yes. Oh my goodness. So the, the songwriter who did not write the lyrics, she wrote the lyrics, said, I think this should be a love song. And she's like, I feel weird about love songs. <laughs> and, then, and she was like actually bouncing her six week old baby oh. on her knee. And she's like, oh, baby, baby. That is so Christian pop crossover. Yeah. It's so <sighs> sweet though. It I love it. It is sweet. It's not toxic Christianity. No. But then like the more explicitly Christian songs, like That's What Love Is For, even more with Ask Me, and then like the most Christian song on the album is Hope Set High. Which I secretly love that song. Yeah. Not so secretly. I guess it's not a secret. I'm telling all of you. <laughs> all, all three of you. I um, I like, you know, the choir comes in. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> we pre-gamed this and talked about this already. But as I said to Molly earlier, my issue with Hope Set High is the line, if there's anything good that happens in this life, it's from Jesus. And that's just like a type of theology that doesn't jive with me. It's just classic prosperity gospel. It's not that different from like The Secret or, you know, anything like that. It's yeah. It makes people feel good. Mm -hmm. It's what it's designed to do. I think don't overthink it. It's <laughs> kind of as kind of their hope. 
we already have talked on previous videos about REM and the Athens, Georgia music scene. Uh, so I'm not gonna go too into that, but I do wanna talk about this album, which was really, I'm pretty sure it's REM's biggest selling album. And it has by far their biggest hit single, which is Losing My Religion. REM is one of those bands that has a real cult following, some really hardcore fans. And most of them dismiss this album as a lesser album. And I think there's something to be interrogated about how this was their biggest hit. The rockest idea of selling out right that we talked about at the in the intro so losing my religion was the lead single off this album and it was their biggest hit it was on top 40 radio um, I don't think Michael Stipe ever expected it from this song that just sort of is repetitive and noodles with that same mandolin lick over and over and over again Peter Buck bought a mandolin and was learning to play it and like as he was learning to play it, he wrote this lick, which I think probably says, it's probably really easy to play on the mandolin. <laughs> That's what I find distasteful about this song. This is probably my least favorite REM song. I actually don't care for it because it is so repetitive. <laughs> then again, I was thinking about this today because I was listening to this album. I hadn't listened to it in years, probably decades after having worn it out really in my teen years. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I remembered liking this album. And even this song. So this song is a song about obsession. And so that repetitiveness of it, I think is an artistic choice that works for the content of the song. But man, like, I hate it. <laughs> I think it's interesting that the song is not actually about religion. Right. It's a song about romantic obsession, about yeah. obsessing over a person. And obsessing about a person, but being afraid to tell them. And then you say something that lets it slip yes. and ruins everything. But Michael Stipe said that losing my religion is a common Southernism about yeah. like losing faith, not necessarily religious yeah. faith. Or, or like, or acting unbecoming yeah. of your religious faith. It was a really popular hit song. And I think to hardcore REM fans, they saw it as, you know, the band kind Kind of selling out or getting too big for their britches maybe. I want to compare the repetitiveness of Losing My Religion to the repetitiveness of the next song, Low. Oh yes. Low is also a very repetitive song, but it sort of does the thing that repetition in something like classical minimalism does mm. and that it actually does change and grow and mm. develop. And like, cause like by the end of the mm -hmm. song, Michael's performance is so impassioned, which is why I scored low higher than losing my religion. Yes. So something I was thinking about when I was listening through this album was from the point of view of somebody who has spent a lot of time with REM's catalog. My dad was a huge REM fan. He was from Georgia. It was something that was sort of always on the radio or on the stereo when I was growing up. I think that there are certain tracks on this album that feel like REM songs. They feel like they could be just equally at home on Eponymous, on Automatic for the People, on any of those other big REM albums. And there are songs on this album that feel like diversions from that. And I think the opening track radio song is one of them. It is about hating the song on the radio. It's kind of a song about how I always felt about losing my religion, <laughs> of that innocent capable song that is chasing you everywhere. It features the rapper Chris One, who was from Boogie Down Productions. Boogie Down Productions. It's interesting to me that that's the opening track of this album that goes on to become, whether intentionally or not, their biggest hit album and probably the biggest diversion from some of their stylistic roots. It's almost like they're winking at their fans. You have all these other songs on here that really sound like REM songs. Like when you get to New Wild Heaven, you're like, oh right, this is what I expect from R.E.M. That Mike Mills, Michael Stipe harmony, mm -hmm. their voices blending together, those sort of swirling melodies, the jangly Rickenbacker <laughs> guitar. <laughs> Same thing with Shiny Happy People, which brings in another great Athens musician, Kate Pearson, who is on several tracks on this album. The songs that Mike Mills sings lead on Near Wild Heaven and Texarkana are the ones that to me, who is someone who did not grow up listening to R.E.M. as much, they sound the most like R.E.M. I, I would say that that's true. And I think that part of the reason for that, this might just be my perception. I feel like Michael Stipe is more inclined to be experimental. And I think that probably the most experimental song on this album is Belong, where it has that spoken voiceover over that sort of, how do you want to describe it? It's kind of like 
swirling. swirling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Spoken voiceover over this swirling musical idea. But I guess my point is Michael Stipe is more inclined to try something new, to be experimental, whereas I think Mike Mills knows what R.E.M. does best. <laughs> I love the unpredictable phrase lengths in Half a World Away. Mm. It sounds so like stream of consciousness. If you remember my hypermeter video, this, this would be a fun one to analyze for hypermeter. Country Feedback is apparently Michael Stipe's favorite R.E.M. song. You know what? I see that being one of his favorite songs he's one of the great emo kids you know whether he wants <laughs> yeah. to admit it or not yeah. another thing that i wanted to point out me and honey is a reaction to the 10,000 maniacs song eat for two Eat for Two is about an unplanned pregnancy from the woman's point of view. Me and Honey is the same pregnancy from the man's point of view. The two of them, Natalie and Michael, often talked about how they were huge influences on each other. They dated for a while. I didn't Michael know that. Michael Stipe is gay. He's bi. Oh. I thought he was gay too. He's bi. <laughs> he was not out at this time. I think it's funny that Losing My Religion, after he came out as bi, people looked at Losing My Religion and were like, oh, he's hinting that he's coming out. It's like, no, that's not actually what the song's about. But like, consider this the hint of the century. Like, mm, don't read. No. <laughs> he's not Taylor Swift. No. <laughs> <laughs> I surprised myself when I went back and listened to this album because I feel like I was one of those R.E.M. fans that was like, oh, this is not a great R.E.M. album. And then I listened to it today and I was like, oh, right. This is a pretty damn good R.E.M. album. <laughs> So I want to start by saying that this is probably the most important album of the year. Of the decade? Yeah, maybe yeah. of the 90s. Yeah, honestly. And it's only 1991. So, We're talking about a serious rock and roll album here. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> Nirvana's Nevermind has so much incredible music on it. And I feel like so many big Nirvana heads almost kind of look down on you if you say that Nevermind is your favorite. They should not because it's incredible. <laughs> Something that is really important with Nevermind and the other album that we're going to talk about today, which is Pearl Jam's 10, and then we could go into some of the other important albums that were a part of this, was the emergence of grunge as a subgenre of rock. Up until now, rock radio and MTV rock shows were dominated by hair metal, really, from the 80s. I mean, we're talking Poison, Styx, Motley Crue, those kinds of bands that were flashy, they used a lot of hairspray. That's why they were called hair metal. They wore makeup. I think of like Twisted Sister. They wore these elaborate costumes, pyrotechnics at these huge arena shows. And that was what people thought of when they thought of rock and roll. And in 1991, you have this hit album, Nirvana's Nevermind, which changes the face of rock and roll music until now. I mean, like we're still seeing that. It's a common fashion thing now for Gen Zers to wear Nirvana Nevermind t-shirts yeah. and sweatshirts. Yeah, right, grunge fashion was just as much a part of it. These grunge bands, a lot of them were from the Pacific Northwest, from Seattle. What we think of as grunge fashion nowadays was just what you wore in the Pacific Northwest because it was cold and rainy. <laughs> like flannel shirts and layers. That was like whatever they picked up at Sears. <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't fashion and then like it became how can you have the latest grunge fashion look like within a year of this album's release. I mean the cultural significance of it cannot be overstated. Nirvana had some following after Bleach. It was mostly local but like because of the following that they already have we have songs like In Bloom which are mm -hmm. making fun of Fairweather fans. Yeah. So they obviously already had them by the time this song this album was written. Mm -hmm. I want to make the sort of bold statement. I think a lot of the appeal of this album is because these songs are basically pop songs. They are very sing-alongable. They've got great melodies. Great melodies. They've got great hooks. They're pop songs with rock sensibilities. To back that up, I want to share this quote from Kurt. Kurt Cobain. About Smells Like Teen Spirit. He said of that song, I was trying to write the ultimate pop song. I was basically trying to rip off the Pixies. He actually goes on in that quote to say that when he first heard the Pixies, he's like, why am I not in this band. You know what's really interesting to me though is that the idea of writing the ultimate pop song and being inspired by the Pixies are the same thing to him. Yeah. That is fascinating because I don't think of the Pixies as being remotely a pop group. They're pop with a lot of noise. They also are structured like pop songs. When they choose to, they've mm. got melodies and hooks like pop yes. songs. I've mentioned 
mentioned In Bloom. In Bloom is the most sing-alongable song on the album, probably. And I think that's really funny because the song is about bandwagon fans who sing along with the songs but don't connect with the music. They haven't felt that kind of pain. The song is also super anti-macho, which happens a lot in this album. Kurt was very much against the uber-masculine man, and that's part of what helped him be such a good person, but also such a good, Kurt would hate this, but idol? For, for for people listening to Nirvana, mm-hmm. who felt like they were outsiders and they didn't fit in. A lot of the lyrics on this album have these really fun, intentional contradictions in them. And I think Come As You Are and Lithium mm-hmm. are both good examples of that. Because like in Come As You Are, he's saying like, no, just be yourself. No, but be my version yes. of yourself. <laughs> Which is, you know, Kurt Cobain complaining about popularity and what the media and the public eye does to people. Lithium is a sort of a different way of contradicting in lyrics because it's, I'm so happy because today I found my friends, they're in my head. The song is about finding God as a way to get over the loss of the speaker's spouse. I think it's so interesting how it really delicately walks this tightrope of how religion feels to people. It feels very much like a 12-step program, Mm -hmm. but also the song is called Lithium, Mm -hmm. which was a treatment for schizophrenia. schizophrenia. So it's like, what of this is the speaker actually thinking and feeling? Something that you're saying about some of the lyrical themes of this album are making me think about how I want to contrast Nirvana against the next album that we're going to talk about and the next band that we're going to talk about, which is Pearl Jam's 10. Because I think they are both sort of the two pinnacles of the grunge movement in the early 90s. And I think that something that I notice is that Nirvana to me seems to be growing forth out of the punk world. A lot of these themes that you're talking about are so punk, right? Like this counterculture, this I don't want to fit in, you can't make me. Actually fitting in is toxic and bad for you (laughs) and you're suppressing who I am. Those kinds of things are so punk. And the music is obviously, especially some of the tracks on the album that were not released as singles are hard punk rock songs. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about Polly. I like the song, but the subject matter is too difficult for me to listen to. Personally, I have such an aversion to sexual violence in any media, and this song was very closely inspired by a true event. Mm -hmm. I think Kurt and the rest of Nirvana had the best of intentions in talking about this story, but this song inspired another incident that made Kurt then write another song about Mm -hmm. on insecticide there's uh, New Age Polly, Mm -hmm. which is responding to that. It obviously was incredibly upsetting to Kurt and he and the band donated a lot of money and a lot of art to campaigns to try and do what they could to fight this. But like, what do you do? But because of that baggage, I'm fine if I'm not listening to the lyrics of this song, but if I listen to the lyrics, I, I'm so upset. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I, I didn't know that story. Polly is the only song on the album that does not have Dave Grohl on drums. This was recorded earlier. Mm. Dave is new for Nevermind. I grew up listening to this album. My brother played this all the time when we were together. My brother's seven years older than me, uh, so he was up the appropriate age to be listening to this. I was not. But it was also, it was unavoidable on it rock was. radio. It was. So I have a lot of thoughts about specific songs on this. Territorial Pissings is such a fun feminist song about yelling at shitty men. Always yell at shitty men. Yeah. I like Drain You a lot because it's such a cute pop song and almost every line of these lyrics is a sexual double entendre. I think it's funny looking at Nirvana lyrics because the lyrics, at least according to what I've read, almost always came last for Kurt and he would write the song and knew what mm. know what the song is about but like he would sort of procrastinated and actually writing the lyrics. And it would be like while they were in the studio that he would finally get the lyrics down. And sometimes it meant that he was just like tweaking them over and over and over. And sometimes it just meant that like, I don't know what I'm gonna say. Lounge Act, I like the melody of this one a lot. And the bass line is really fun. But this is the song on the album that I can never remember which song this is. Like which one is Lounge Act? And then if I like think hard enough about it, I can hear like that bum ba da bum ba da which is mm-hmm. what yeah. Molly said, that's a Pixies bass line. <laughs> yes, it sounds like a Kim Deal bass line. Yeah. Stay away, God is gay. On a plane, you cannot tell me that this is not a pop song. That is a pop song. It is a pop song. <laughs> it's a loud pop song, I'm but it's a pop play. song. It's got the diversion to a different, not a different key. It's focusing on a different chord area in the bridge. And with the harmonies, it's just such a pop, it's a pop sensibility. It fits the form. Something in the way is 
bleak but beautiful. I love something in the way. Endless Nameless though. I think it works if you're actually listening to this on a CD and it's the hidden track that comes after 10 minutes of silence after something in the way. Can we say like, I miss that? I do too. <laughs> Listening on streaming where this is its own track, I don't think it works. This was just a jam. This was not pre-planned at all. The lyrics are nonsense. I think one of the last things that we need to talk about though is the album art. Oh, and the whole controversy with the baby. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that that baby, now an adult, has tried to sue the remaining man members of the band so many times and is thrown out every time. Hilarious. Yeah. It's such a good image. It is a great image. It's interesting because I think the image says something about our conversation about about pop music. I think so too. 1991, we have the birth of grunge. Uh, now we say the birth of grunge, the grunge had existed in the Pacific Northwest, but it became mainstream in 1991 with Nirvana's Nevermind. And then all the record labels flew their guys to Seattle <laughs> to try to find like the next big hit grunge band. One of those bands was Pearl Jam. 10 is Pearl Jam's debut album. A couple guys from the band had been in a different band together that broke up and then they were starting a new band. They brought in guitarist Mike McCready and vocalist Eddie Vedder of the iconic sort of quintessential grunge vocals. Is this beer in shot? I talked a moment ago about how I feel like Nirvana approaches the grunge aesthetic from a distinctly punk stance. In contrast to that, Pearl Jam comes at it from a distinctly metal stance. And part of what I think makes me say that is the absolute guitar god level shredding of Mike McCready. This is an album that I grew up listening to. It was one of my brother's favorite albums. My brother loves to talk about how our aunt gave it to him for like his birthday or something. Really? When he That's was fun. like 10 or something. Did he ask for it? No, I don't think so. I think she was just like, you need to listen to this. This is another album that dominated rock radio for the next decade, if not more. Even Flow was, I think, probably their lead single. And it is a hard hard rock song. It has long, flashy guitar solos. What makes it grunge? The rhythm guitars have a lot of distortion on them. The band dresses in the grunge aesthetic. They have long hair. They're wearing cargo shorts and flannels. Intelligibility of lyrics. Oh, who knows what Eddie Vedder is singing about at any given time? We <laughs> but the thing is, you don't care because it fucking slaps. Yeah. Right? It's a great song. This song sort of the first half of it is just hit after hit after hit. We have Once, followed by Even Flow, the biggest hit off the album, followed by Alive, which has that great boom, ba -da -ba -da -da. And a really great performance by Eddie. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about Eddie's vocals, and I think that's why he garnered so many imitators, is that, first of all, it's instantly recognizable. The singing is rough and gruff, but it's also melodic. I like how, even though there's a lot of scratch and mumble to Eddie's vocals, Vocals, there's a point mm -hmm. that it's it's like on the note. It's not just approximating. Mm -hmm. It's really good singing. It's good singing. And that's why you have people trying to pretend to sing like him up to this day. And then you have Black. Something that Pearl Jam does really well, and maybe better than Nirvana, is to write a, a slow emotional, heartfelt ballad, mm -hmm. right? Like love song, really, yeah. right? Black is a song that like when I was like 16, if a guy like, okay, here's Wonderwall <laughs> with black, yeah. I would have been like, <sighs> <laughs> it's, Dead. It's over. It's over. <laughs> Fun tidbit about Black. Eddie really did not want Black to be a radio single. Mm -hmm. He's like, this is too personal. I want people to listen to it as part of the album, but I do not want this on the radio. The band actually called radio stations and said, if the label sent this to you, please do not play it. That didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> that feels like a marketing gimmick to me. Please don't play it. Whatever <laughs> you do, don't play my song and make it a hit single. <laughs> Are you saying that this is a pop? album? I think I might be. I wanted to put these four albums in the order that I did because to my mm. taste and sensibility, they're most pop to least pop. Okay. What makes the Pearl Jam album less like a pop album? One thing to me is the extended jam sessions and long mm. guitar solos. I'd have to go back and check, but I feel like there are probably radio edits that cut out some of those oh, guitar sure. solos. I'm sure. Nirvana's Nevermind 
the tracks that were not released as singles tend to have a hardcore punk aesthetic, fast drum beats. With Pearl Jam, their back of the album songs feel almost like Poison songs, right? With some of these lengthy guitar solos with Mike McCready. I mean, I don't know. I think he would have given Van Halen a run for his money. Does this rose have a thorn? Oh my God. <laughs> it's every rose, Michael. <laughs> so I just think it's an interesting thing to consider because I think a lot of people, they're gonna say, well, you know, it's grunge. And the thing is, like you said, every artwork is a reaction or continuation of what came before it. And so punk was there before and Nirvana was a continuation of that. Hair metal came before and Pearl Jam in yeah. a way is a continuation of that. But they kind of eventually... Yeah, they meet <laughs> together and then things start to diverge again. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, I love it. This was just a really exciting time for rock music. Black is definitely a rock song because no pop song would have that long of a play out. Jeremy, like Polly from Nevermind, is another one of those songs that is so difficult for me to listen to because of the real life story that it's telling. It's a great fucking song it's so is the good. thing. <laughs> I can listen to Jeremy. I can't watch the music video. This is one of those things that I struggle with because artists using tragic and dark stories for cred. I don't think that either is really that, but it's towing the line. I think Polly more so than Jeremy, but like, should you not make art about it? Because like art is healing and transformative. How, and... how do these songs relate to that one song on the Amy Grant album? It's obviously a pop version, right? Where you're taking a more abstract idea of like children who are being victimized. You said, why would somebody put a song like this? on the album, why would they release it as a single? Yeah. It's yeah, the it same is. thing. And I think from an artistic point of view, at least with the Pearl Jam and the Nirvana of it all, you're hearing these horrible stories and you're using art to reflect and meditate on it. When it gets released as a single and you're making money off of it, like then what happens? I don't know, that's a question to be had about like, what is the role of art? And when you commercialize it, like how does that change the role of art? And what is art versus what is entertainment? Which is a thing I have an obsession about. Yeah, and, and you can't ever completely <laughs> disentangle them from each other. Oceans comes right after Jeremy, and I love it, how it's a song about how much he likes surfing. It has a very musical theatery guitar part. Album sequencing matters. You yeah, know. guitar solos. There are so many guitar solos on this album, and sometimes I feel like they're not really warranted. I think it's in black. Mike noodling mm -hmm. in the verses while Eddie is singing, that is distracting to me. I still really love black. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great song, but he's just yeah. like soloing on a blues scale oh. quietly in the background while oh, Eddie yeah. is singing, and I'm just like, I don't want that there. In general, a lot of the solos on this album, and this is just me and my tastes when it comes to solos on an instrument, I wish they weren't there <laughs> or they were significantly shorter. I like how Eddie is playing off the solos and like basically scatting along with them in a lot of these songs, but it's just like, ugh, I, I wish that were less. To me, it's guitar solos to show off how good Mike McCready is and he's excellent, yes. Mm -hmm. But that is not, to my taste, interesting compositionally. And it's also the band James because it's fun to jam, yeah, right? Yeah. And because the audience is into it, into right. the, the rock. Release, the last track. It's a slow burn and Mala and I both love a slow burn. Especially as the final track on an album. It's where you put the slow burn. The thing about Release is that I feel like it doesn't grow enough and I don't think that's Pearl Jam's fault. I think that's the editor and mixer, the audio people's fault. Because I feel like their performances grow, but there's something about the levels that they don't grow with it. I want it to just like blossom more. My overarching plan of this video of talking about pop versus rock, we didn't like go into a lot of specifics while we were talking about this, but I think a lot of these things that we were talking about are almost so evident. Maybe that's just to me and how I listen to music. Labels for anything ever are silly and unnecessary, but they are helpful in some situations. For instance, at the record store, if everything is just music and everything's just in alphabetical order by artist title, like how do you find new stuff? But where do you draw the boundaries? It's so hard. And it's getting harder. Especially since it's now easier to make music. You don't need to be signed to a label to make music. You can do whatever ever speaks to you and no label is saying oh that's too pop of a, an idea you should push that farther rock because you are a rock band we signed you to this because you are a rock band or vice versa or whatever but i would encourage everyone who is a rock supremacist don't look down on pop i'll come for you <laughs>
So much of why rock supremacy exists, I think is rooted in sexism and racism. And I think also really outdated ideas about mass marketed music that is designed to fit a formula and, and be easily marketable. And so when you go beyond that, which is so much easier to do now more than ever, there is so much exciting music out there. And so I think when you limit yourself to I only listen to rock or like what you hear all the time and I think it grates on both of us is like I love all music just not rap or country. I think it is also a product of the kinds of music that are being shoved down our throats by the people in power in the music industry who are pushing a certain kind of music that has mass market appeal that will sell out arena shows and if you are somebody who likes to go against the stream then your instinct is that that's not cool. And I think if you stop and say, what is it about this that is appealing to so many people? You might find that you're one of those people. <laughs> and I guess, yeah, and don't yuck somebody's yum, you know? Well, anyway, we've been talking for a very long time and we need to cook dinner. So yeah. thank you so much for watching. To this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like. Up there is the button to subscribe to the channel if you're interested. We talk about music and video games mostly, but we talk about some other stuff a little bit sometimes too. Like this video if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Don't, no, no, not thumbs up. Still like it anyway. Let us know your thoughts. We want to hear what you like, what you think is an interesting pop or rock crossover. And lastly, maintain of yourselves. See you next time.